Mom. Hi, Mommy. I hope you're having a wonderful day and you had a lovely nap. Um, we're on shipwrecked. We're still in the gates of Zion, although we're kind of far. Look, we're past the halfway mark. Mm -hmm. So, uh, is it shipwreck? No, it's check checkmate. Sorry, not shipwreck. Checkmate. And they just saw the American ship, and they put them all on the little trawler, Ave Maria, and we're going to see what happens. All right, but they're going. They're not going to the ship. They're going back to Jerusalem. It was past curfew when Hassan entered the dingy lobby of the Hotel Samaritans. The desk clerk leaned against the counter, reading the Cairo Times, which was spread out before him. He stared intently at the front page, studying the latest pronouncements by Arab leaders gathered at the Cairo University to discuss which course of action they should take against the Jews of Palestine. While the others talked, the motif in Jerusalem translated the thought into deadly action. Hassan's final task at the hotel tonight was only one small example of Hajamin's political savvy. Nine other members of Hajamin's staff had already left the hotel for Bobby Wad, Bob El Wad. Only Hassan remained behind to redeem himself in the eyes of his leader. He would set the detonator for the bomb Gerhard had packed into the leather case he now carried. Hassan glanced around the lobby as an old man draped himself in a chair while another man stood at the iron gates of the elevator and argued with an old woman. Hassan instantly recognized her. You see there, mother, the man said, pulling a pocket watch from his vest. You must stay here with me and Sammy. Hassan started towards the t stairs, and then he hesitated. I cannot stay. The professor shall be worried, answered the old woman. Hmm. Hassan smiled and turned back to the elevator. And I shall worry if you leave. My mother, you must be so stubborn. Why must you be so stubborn? We shall simply telephone in the morning when the exchange is open. The professor would worry more if you were to leave now. Hassan raised his hand to his mouth and coughed, <laughs> interrupting the discussion between Ishmael and Miriam. Tonight is not a night to be out. They say there will be a disturbance in the Monf Monfior quarter. You see, exclaimed Israel, Ishmael, not half a mile from here. One cannot be too careful. He reached past Miriam and pushed the elevator button. Huh? said Miriam, crossing her arms in disgust. The kind gentleman is right, Mother. Now come along. Jews or Muslims, Miriam shook her head in resignation. And most certainly it is the motif's men tonight, dear lady. Hassam pulled back the gate of the elevator and stepped aside for Miriam to enter. That gangster spat the old woman perhaps there would be some hope for peace if the devil were not in our midst mother please ishmael looked furtively around the lobby and gently urged her into the elevator hoodlums ignorant bullies all of them miriam said loudly as hassan lunged against uh, as hassan lugged the stoop case into the tiny cubicle and put the gate shut behind him Oh, he has the bomb with him, Mom. A little Hitler, this homage, I'm in, and the innocent die for his glory. Alas, your words are so true, Hassan earnestly said as the elevator lurched into a slow ascent. Hmm. Now I've lost my place again. <laughs> i got to pay more attention. Okay. Uh... Second floor, he asked as it ground to a stop. Ishmael shook his head. No, no, thank you. We're on the fourth. Hassan stepped out of the elevator into the darkened hallway of the second floor and closed the iron gate. Pleasant dreams, he smiled broadly and nodded a farewell. As the elevator groaned and whined away, he entered the room just to the right of the shaft. Switching on the light, he glanced around and carried the suitcase to a wall that bordered the shaft as Gerhardt
had instructed him, the elevator shaft. Carefully, he unlatched the locks and lifted the lid to reveal a simple wired bomb that contained enough TNT to demolish the hotel, shatter the windows for a half a mile. He wound the clock that would trigger the detonator and set the time for six o'clock the next morning. At that hour, people would just be waking up, though nothing not yet out of their rooms. He regretted that they would have no warning of their impending death. It was as those last expressions of fear on the faces of his victims that he liked to imagine the most. Oh well, they would not die in their sleep at any rate, he said. He closed the lid of the suitcase, switched off the light, locked the door behind him, and then he skipped down the stairs, happy in the knowledge that indeed the innocent would die for the glory of Hajamin, Mutif of Israel. Throughout the night, the Ave Maria raced ahead of the storm. A little past midnight, Ellie wadded up her jacket for a pillow, laid down in the gallery between the counter and the icebox, and tried to sleep. Seasickness had begun to take its toll among the refugees crowded in the hole, and Moshi resumed his post at the bow of the ship, watching for signs, signs of a British gunboat. Just past 4.30, the little trawler shuddered and lurched. Ehud was suddenly jolted and rolled against, I'm sorry, Ellie was suddenly jolted and rolled against the icebox. She struggled to sit up, bracing herself against the counter while she looked at her watch. For a moment, she could not remember where she was or why, and then a feeling of anxiety crept over her. She stood slowly, clinging to the countertop to keep from falling back in, with the bucking Ave Maria. The ship, Moshi, the faces, all came back to her with a rush. She reached for a thermos of coffee and rolled across, as it rolled across the galley floor and bumped her foot. Then she pull, pulled on her jacket and made her way through the galley, past the sick and sleeping refugees, and taking the steps back up to the deck. The night was as black as pitch, and the rain fell, slanted and hard, in the wind, stinging her face. She groped her way to the wheelhouse with the thermos bottle tucked under her arm. When she opened the door, Moshi stood at the wheel as Ehud took his turn with the field glasses. I brought coffee, she said cheerfully. Neither Moshi nor Ehud answered. Instead, Ehud took the wheel and handed Moshi the field glasses. She's got us all right, said Ehud. Yes, Moshi answered grimly. She is signaling another. Sun will be up within the hour. Then we are done for. Ehud growled as he stroked the wheel. This may be our last voyage, old girl, he said gruffly. It is not checkmate yet, my friend, Moshi laid a hand on Ehud's arm. Ellie stared bleakly out the window of the wheelhouse, watching as the running lights of a British destroyer cut through the water on a direct course for them. Are they going to catch us, she asked. Can't we get away? We've been trying since two. Moshi rubbed his forehead wearily. Ellie opened the thermos and handed coffee to him. He took a swig and then handed it to Ehud. We are not far from Nahara. He wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. There is no other way, I fear. Ehud's voice was filled with sad determination. Use the wireless. Call the kibbutz. We'll run her around the, aground on the beach. Just let the British try to follow us up onto a sand barge. Oh yeah, it's a destroyer, Mom. It's too big. They will drag their bellies 300 yards out from shore. <coughs> Sorry. It is your ship, Ehud, your decision. Are you certain? Ehud did not answer, but instead silently stroked the wheel and nodded. Moshi took Ellie's hand. Come with me. We haven't much time. Ellie followed him down the steps and on, onto the deck. Over the roars of the wind, she heard the engine of the destroyer. And then searchlights clicked on and slammed the darkness that had covered Ave Maria. As the light engulfed them, Ellie raised her hand against the glare. She felt curiosity like a rabbit caught in the road in the headlights of an approaching car. She wanted to run, but there was no place to go. The wail of a siren screeched above the din of the engines and storms. Come on, Moshi cried, taking her by the arm and leading her down the steps. He stood at the bottom step and gazed over the pale faces before him. It was a recurrent nightmare, now becoming a reality. For the past several hours, he explained in three different languages. 
we have been pursued by a British destroyer. We turned back into the storm in hopes of evading her, but it has done no good. Now we will run the ship aground. Crews will be on hand to help you to shore. Do not fear, he raised his voice as a moan of panic filled the hold. You will be taken care of. There is little time. Gather your things. He hurried past questions, and Ellie followed him, feeling helpless as she encouraged in English. People could not understand her words. She tried to smile. She put her hands away from the fearful clutching fingers. Are we going to be okay, Moshi? She asked. If you have ever prayed, now is the moment to do so. And he strode down the corridor, past the galley, into a small room in the front of the ship. He struck a match, lit a kerosene lantern, and then sat on the wooden crate and began to tinker with the dials of a black radio. Static crackled over the receiver. It's the storm, he said impatiently as a high-pitched whine answered him. Mary calling Gideon, come in please. Calling Gideon, Mary calling Gideon. Oh, God help us, please. Ellie prayed silently. Help him get through. Calling Gideon. A whine slid into a human voice that crackled over the receiver. Mary, Gideon, you're late. We've got a wolf on our trail. We're going to bring her in. How many? Repeat. How many lambs? Ninety-three. Repeat. Ninety-three. When Ellie turned to the deck, the first returned to the deck, the first gray light of dawn filtered through the black clouds, and the destroyer had been joined by a smaller gunboat. Ellie could plainly make out the movement of the sailors on the deck, and all eyes were turned toward them. The destroyer slid alongside, dwarfing the Ave Maria, causing her to shudder in its wake. By order of your Majesty, of His Majesty's Mandate Government, a stern voice bellowed over a bullhorn, you are under arrest. Ehud pulled the whistle in response and then turned hard to port and headed the Ave Maria straight into shore and the breakers. Get them up here on the deck, he yelled to Ellie. Already, Moshi had the refugees standing in, patiently in line. One by one, he urged them onto the deck. Ellie helped with the children, calming them. Finally, when the young mother began to sob, she put her arms around her and comforted her, comforted her without words. Sing, Ellie showed it, shouted to Moshi over the wail of the siren. As the refugees filed on the deck, Moshi began to sing, Bishuva Adon Adonai and every voice joined him in a hymn of defiance about the giants pursuing them. Turn about, turn about, the bullhorn ordered. Turn about starboard, Ave Maria, by order of his majesties. The refugees answered by singing even louder as Ehud steered the little ship nearer and nearer to the breakers. Ellie could see a group of men and women waiting on the beach ahead. She reloaded her camera, snapped pictures of the defiant faces of the refugees and the armor of the destroyer as the captain bellowed insults and threats and finally turned back from Ehud's suicide course. The group on the beach launched two wooden lifeboats, pushing them out past the breakers toward the sandbar where the bottom loomed up in anticipation of Ave Maria's final destination. Hold on, everybody, Moshi cried as the little ship chugged silently on. Mothers clutched their children to them and held them onto them one another. Tucking their faces down against shoulders and backs, the singing stopped, but the siren wailed on as the destroyer and her companion stood offshore and waited for the inevitable end. Inevitable end. The wheelhouse tears streamed down Ehud's cra craggy face and clung to his beard in glistening drops. You've been a fine lady, he stroked the wheel. I shall miss you. And he shoved the engine into reverse as the bar raised to meet the hull and she slid onto the sand with a grinding thump and lodged herself shook securely. He had shut down the engine, clambered down the steps to help the passengers who had fallen to the deck. Strong shoulders of young men pushed against the oars of the lifeboats, moving quickly toward the crushed hull of Ave Maria. Moshi rigged a lifeline from her bow and threw it to the curly-haired young man in a boat below. Calmly, men and women climbed down a rope ladder into the safety of the little boats. The stronger of the group and those who could swim moved to the bow and plunged overboard into the icy water where members of the kibitz waded out to help them to shore. 
Ellie continued to snap pictures until the last minute, then packed the camera in her bag, handed it to the little boy who smiled at her the evening before. Tell him to hang on to this, Ellie said to Moshi, and Moshi put both hands on the boy's shoulder and repeated the instructions in Polish. Can't get wet, she said. Okay, I'm going to finish this, Mom. I hope you get it. I don't know. It's going to be past 15 minutes. I see that. The little boy nodded seriously, clutching it tightly to himself as he clambered down the ladder. Okay, this is it, Moshi said, as the last of the group plunged into the water and grasped the light lifeline to shore. All out, Ehud climbed down the deck for the first, for the last time. The water was knee-deep in the hold, but the damage was not so great that she couldn't be floated again, if it were not for the destroyer that waited for the last passenger to get clear. All clear, he shouted to Moshe and Ellie, and he joined them on the deck and picked up a bundle wrapped in oilskin raincoat. It's her compass, he said with questioning to their questioning looks. She has taken me many places, and I will not leave her. Moshe turned to Ellie. Can you swim? As he remembered his encounter with Rachel. Sure, I spent half my life at the sand in Balboa, Ellie laughed, as she put her field books, uh, pulled off her field boots and jacket. Race me, Ellie stood at the bow, and Moshe stood grimacing in anticipation of the cold water. So jump, he said impatiently. When she hesitated a moment longer, he shoved her into the murky gray water, cold and closed over her head, and she came up sputtering and coughing just in time to see Moshi dive from the bow. Well, come on, he shouted as he swam ahead of her with sure, steady strokes, and she followed the hundred yards to the sand. Trucks from the kibbutz had, kibbutz had pulled up behind the dunes, and by the time Moshi and Ellie staggered towards shore, Ehud, just behind them, refugees were already being loaded and driven to hiding places in the area. He had turned to gaze across the breakers to the Ave Maria, perched forlornly on the sandbar. Maybe you can float her again, Ellie said hopefully. He had shook his head sadly. It is not to be. The three of them stood and watched as the destroyer lowered her guns, took aim, and the scream of the siren in the wind was suddenly shattered by the flash and roar of a cannon, and the Ave Maria splintered into a thousand pieces. Checkmate, he had whispered. That makes me want to cry, Mom. <laughs> okay, so I'm not supposed to go over 15 minutes. This is almost 18. So if you don't get it, write me and tell me, okay? And I'll do a different one. I gotta go now. I love you.